my voice? Oh, yep, that sounds good. All right, yes. So I focus on using radio observations to look at magnetic fields and storms caused by those magnetic fields on flare stars, which are typically M dwarfs with strong magnetic activity. And the motivation for that is to see how these stars will affect planets. So first I'll start in by telling you guys a bit about space weather and space weather around other stars. And then look at what's the baseline of the radio emission coming from the sun that we can expect to see all the time in other stars. Move on to coherent radio bursts which is the tool that we use for looking for space weather events on other stars. And then I'll go through some of the projects and data that I've been working with. So starting with space weather. What is space weather? This concept originates in 1859 when there was a thing called the Carrington flare or the Carrington event. That was the point where we discovered solar flares when a few ob solar observers saw a big white spot appear on the sun for a few minutes. And then a few hours later, all over the world, people saw brilliant aurorae. And the aurorae were seen as far south as equatorial countries like Colombia. And so this gave a hint that whatever happened on the sun to cause that flare also had an impact on Earth and its magnetic field. Now, this is going to be really relevant to astronomers as we look at planets around M dwarfs. Why are planets around M dwarfs important? M dwarfs are the most common type of star. This is a sen uh, what's the word? census of the different types of stars near the sun within 10 parsecs, I think, 32 light years anyways. And this pile here is M dwarfs. So the most common stars near us are M dwarfs and the most common stars generally. Now, in addition, planets are relatively easy to detect around M dwarfs because they cover a larger fraction of the star which means that they create a bigger fractional signal in the light from the star, and also they're able to tug the star back and forth, creating a Doppler shift in the star that's relatively big. So it's relatively easy to detect and characterize planets around M dwarfs compared to bigger stars. Now, with Kepler, we've also learned that Earth-sized planets are fairly common around M dwarfs, which means that if we're looking for an analog to Earth around other stars, we, and we want to find one relatively nearby, we should probably be looking around M dwarfs. This has been confirmed with a few recent detections, both around Proxima Sen, not shown here, and also around TRAPPIST-1, suggesting that there are seven roughly Earth-sized planets around this M8 dwarf that's 12 parsecs away, so 40-ish light years. And we can argue over which of these may or may not be habitable for life as we know it. But one of the things that affects this question of habitability is magnetic activity these flares and associated process and processes. Now, stars are generally stars with a convective outer layer. So F, G, K, and M dwarfs, the smaller types of stars, including the sun, they tend to be born with strong magnetic fields and strong magnetic activity. This is because they're born rotating fairly rapidly and the rotation powers a strong magnetic dynamo. But over time, as material flows off of the star, that material interacts with the star's magnetic field and causes it to slow down. However, there's evidence that M dwarfs don't slow down for a very long time. And because of that, or perhaps not related to that at all, 
they also retain strong magnetic activity for a very long time. They maintain very high levels of magnetic activity, flares, strong magnetic fields throughout hundreds of millions to billions of years, affecting the long-term evolution of planets around those stars. Now, what does that mean for us? So here's an illustration of some material that's the corona of the sun or a star is at a few million degrees. It's ionized material confined by the star's magnetic field. And if the star has a strong magnetic field and a lot of flares, it has a lot of this coronal gas too. Now, M dwarfs are known to produce some really spectacularly energetic flares. We think that the famous flare stars, AD Leonis, UV Ceti, and a few others, which are M dwarfs, produce flares at a rate about one a month that are 10 to the 34 ergs which is, depending on your estimates, 10 to 100 times more energy than the Carrington event. And remember that planets around these stars are much closer to the star. So they're seeing these extreme events regularly. Now, if we apply the solar model for space weather to these stars, we expect that really high energy flares are accompanied by coronal mass ejections or CMEs. These are eruptions of magnetized plasma that move away from the star. And in the sun, a highly energetic flare is almost certainly associated with a CME. It's 99.5% or something like that. It's a very high rate of association. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I don't remember what the boundary was off the top of my head, but it's like 10 to the 30 ergs or 31 or something. Like these things are orders of magnitude beyond that. Now, if the coronal mass ejection is moving fast enough, and fast enough basically means faster than the alphane speed in the corona, then it will form a shock. And this shock has important consequences for planets. In particular, at the shock, uh, particles are going to be accelerated at the shock front. And those particles will stream ahead along open magnetic field lines to interact with the planetary atmosphere. And because these accelerated particles are so energetic, they're able to penetrate deeply into the planetary atmosphere potentially in, um, causing significant chemical interactions. For instance, this paper, they modeled a 10 to the 34 erg flare that was observed on flare star 80 Leonis. And they saw and they found that that flare would deplete almost all of the ozone from the atmosphere of an Earth-like planet. And it would take about two years to recover. Now, this is a flare that we think is occurring once a month on this star. Now, as the CME continues to progress outwards, eventually the bulk of the CME, this magnetized plasma, will interact with the planet. The kinetic energy of the CME, as well as its magnetic field, will lead to a compression of the planet's magnetic field. And since the flare that occurred earlier has also heated the atmosphere, puff it, puffing it up, this makes it easier for the CME to erode the atmosphere. So over the course of many events and millions to billions of years, you could easily erode an Earth-like atmosphere, even with the protection of an Earth-like magnetic field. So it's possible that Earth-like planets around M dwarfs may need additional magnetic protection, or maybe they'll just be in really big trouble. So there are three things I discussed here. Flares, increases of light from the star, coronal mass ejections, eruptions of magnetized plasma, which tend to be associated with flares, and energetic protons, which originate at the shock front of coronal mass ejections and at the flare site.
But there's a problem. Oh, and another thing to, to note is that in addition to impacts on the planet, CMEs may also dominate stellar mass loss and or angular momentum evolution, especially for young M dwarfs, not for the sun. So here's the problem, which is that while flares are frequently observed on these other stars, CMEs and energetic particles are not. Why not? They're hard to see. Oh, we're going to get to that again in a moment. All right. So here's that relationship between solar flares and CMEs that I mentioned. In addition, so for the high energy solar flares, you get 100% CME association rate. But you also see a correlation between solar flare energy and CME kinetic energy. So all of the predictions that I showed you about the, or told you about, whoops, about the impact of, of solar, or of stellar coronal mass ejections and particles on planets, they all rely on these solar relationships between between flare energy and other properties of CMEs and energetic particles. And in particular, they have to extrapolate out to here. So that's a little challenging. So we would like to instead observationally test the properties of CMEs and particle events that end up in this high energy part of the plot. Now, flares, again, we can do fairly easily. For a nearby flare star, you can do this with a photometry with a small optical telescope can give you a pretty good handle on flare energy. But for CME properties, how can we do this? So why is it so hard to detect CMEs in energetic protons? Well, we discovered CMEs by looking at the sun with a coronagraph. And we saw in white light, white light from the sun that was scattering off of CMEs, we saw these blobs moving out from the sun. But these things are much, much fainter than the star or even than the planet. So considering how hard it is to detect a planet in another solar system with a coronagraph, a CME is not happening anytime soon, at least any CME that we would expect to see. So we want to find wavelengths that improve the contrast ratio between the star and the CME. We want the CME to be brighter than the star or the planet. Now, where can we do that? One thing we can look at is chron chromospheric or coronal emission lines. Look for the material in the outer atmosphere of the star that's going to move outwards. And we look for a blue shift, something moving towards us. And if it's going pretty fast, faster than the escape velocity, we say that could very well be a CME. There has been about mm, two, three such events confidently identified as a big flare with material moving outwards faster than the escape velocity. And it's not clear yet whether that's due to sensitivity limitations or some other issue, such as maybe these stars don't have that many CMEs. Another thing we can look for is radio emission. On the sun, solar CMEs are associated with very bright radio bursts. And at low frequencies, these radio bursts can be hundreds, tens to hundreds to thousands of times brighter than the quiet radio emission from the sun. So this gets to be bright enough that we could potentially detect it around other stars. So this is a plot for, <laughs> this is my confusogram, I guess. So what I'm showing you here is a plot of wavelength on the x-axis and brightness, flux density on the y-axis of radio emission from the sun. And there's two features I want to highlight. Don't try to read the whole thing. One is these bursts. This is the emission that comes from flares and coronal mass ejections. It can be very bright. And one is the quiet radio emission from the sun, which, as you can see, especially at longer wavelengths, lower frequencies, is orders of magnitude fainter. So I'm going to start by just showing you guys what the quiet radio sun looks like 
and demonstrate that we are getting to the point now with sensitivity of our radio facilities that we can detect it at stellar distances. So here's a five gigahertz radio emission of, or radio picture of the sun. And there's two components to look at. There's the blue fairly steady disk, which is 10,000 Kelvin thermal emission, so basically black body emission, coming from the chromosphere, which is a 10,000 degree layer around the outer edge of the sun. And this is free free or bremsstrahlung emission. But then there's these hot spots in red and green. And this is one million degree emission, also thermal, but it's coming from the corona, the, the furthest out layer of the sun, which is a million degrees, and it's in regions where there's a strong magnetic field. And in, that, in regions with a strong magnetic field, you get emission at the cyclotron frequency from electrons circling the magnetic field. And that's what produces this bright emission. So this is the quiet radio sun, and as the number of these spots varies on the star, you can use it to the total emission from the sun to trace the solar magnetic activity cycle over the course of 11 years. And we're not quite there yet with other stars, but when the SKA comes fully online, we hope to be able to do this for stars out to 50 parsecs. The square kilometer array, a big low frequency, thank you for asking, a big low frequency radio array being built in South Africa. So with current facilities, including an upgrade to the very large array, the VLA, in New Mexico, we're now able to detect the quiet emission from other stars, but at slightly higher frequencies. So just the chromosphere, the 10,000 degree. And so here's a nearby star, Eta, Cassiope Eta Cassiopeiae, which I observed at 35 gigahertz and detected. So we are getting to the point where we have the sensitivities to detect the quiet emission from these stars. So that, if we can start to detect this, it's pretty promising that we can now detect these. And that's what I spend most of my time going after. So what we're looking for is stellar coherent radio bursts. Coherent is, means that we're seeing kind of a laser-like process um, where once you get some emission, then that emission interacts with the, um, the particles in the source region and gets amplified and becomes brighter and brighter. So through a coherent emission process, you're able to get extremely bright emission. For the astronomers, you get brightness temperatures of 10 to the 15 or even 10 to the 30 through the coherent processes that we see in the sun and stars. So there's two coherent processes that are responsible for stellar radio emission as far as we know. One is plasma emission in which you get uh, a oscillations of electron density in the corona of the star, the hot ionized material around the star. And the electrons oscillate at the plasma frequency. When those waves interact, this oscillation couples into electromagnetic radiation and you get emission at the plasma frequency or its second harmonic. And so, if you get, when you get emission, plasma emission from a star, you're seeing emission where the frequency is set only by the electron density in the source region. So again, frequency traces directly to density in the source region. We see this process in solar and stellar flares. We also see it significantly at the shock front of coronal mass ejections and associated with proton events. Now the second process that's important in the sun and stars and planets is electron cyclotron maser emission. This occurs at the cyclotron frequency, the rate at which an electron spirals around magnetic field lines. 
And the cyclotron frequency is set only by the magnetic field strength in the source region. And we see this in solar and stellar flares, and we also see it in radio aurorae of brown dwarfs and planets, so periodic bursts of radio emission that you see once per rotation period from stars and planets. That's predominantly plasma emission that you saw in that plot. Um, cyclotron maser emission can actually be quite a bit brighter than plasma emission, but it's pretty rare to see in the sun, and you see it only in very short bursts. Um, you see it lots in Jupiter, though, which was discovered here at DTM. So. That makes it exciting to visit here. Um, so based on, since the plasma frequency depends on electron density and the cyclotron frequency depends on magnetic field strength, in both cases, um, the densities and magnetic field strengths that we know exist in the corona of the sun or stars correspond to fairly low frequencies. By which I mean plasma emission is observed up to one or two gigahertz on the sun and stars and down to kilohertz frequencies. Whereas cyclotron maser emission is observed up to about 10 gigahertz on the sun and stars and on planets, again, down to kilohertz frequencies. Now, another property that useful for interpreting stellar radio emission is circular polarization. Coherent stellar emission can have up to 100% circular polarization, meaning that it's fully right-hand or fully left-hand polarized. And the sense of the polarization is determined by the combination of the emission mechanism and the orientation of the line of sight magnetic field. So if we have an observer here, then a parcel of material, a source here, is aligned, the propagation vector is aligned with the magnetic field, your, um, your right or left-hand polarization is going to be set by which emission mechanism. But if we have a parcel of material down here, the line of sight magnetic field is going the other way and you're going to get the reverse sense of polarization. So this will come up again later. So how do we actually find coronal mass ejections with radio emission? Here's a plot of the radio emission from a solar coronal mass ejection. So this is called a dynamic spectrum, and it's showing time on the x-axis and frequency on the y-axis. And these dark patches are the emission from the, from the CME. And what's happening is that as the CME moves out from the sun and forms a shock front, it, excel it excites plasma emission at the density in front of, at the plasma frequency corresponding to the density in front of the shock front. Then, as it moves further outwards, it moves into lower densities and the emission sweeps to lower frequencies. So, you can use the rate of change of frequency to estimate the velocity of the coronal mass ejection. Now, you can look at events with different frequency drift rates to identify different types of sources in the solar corona. On the right here, you see events that drift in frequency fairly slowly over the course of minutes. This is shock fronts moving out from the solar corona caused by CMEs. And again, these are the sorts of events that could erode a planet's atmosphere. On the right, uh, on the left, you see events that drift downwards in frequency very rapidly. And this corresponds to source speeds of about a third of the speed of light. And what this is, is this is high speed electrons zooming out away from the sun 
along open magnetic field lines. And where you have high speed electrons zooming away, you also have high speed protons. So this type of event is predictive of the energetic proton events that can interact chemically with pl planetary atmospheres and drive non-equilibrium chemistry, including depleting ozone. So back to our goal, we wanted to find a way to, de to test the CME part of this relationship between flare energy and CME properties. So now, if we can detect a stellar CME in radio emission, then we can use that to constrain the velocity and with some hand waving, effectively, the kinetic energy. So I'm going to start with a project I worked on as part of my graduate thesis, the Starburst project, which was going to be dedicated, going to be, those are ominous words, dedicated to looking for these CME-type bursts from other stars. And Starburst was designed, oh, well, we'll come back to Starburst. Right, motivation. Now, we know that M dwarfs, which would have been the targets of Starburst, M dwarfs produce bright, coherent radio emission. What we don't know is, are any of those the CME type events? Here's a coherent radio burst observed on 80 Leo, 80 Leonis, with Arecibo. And this is a million times brighter than the quiet radio emission from the sun. So this is Jansky bright for anyone who knows radio astronomy units. So easily detectable. And this event does seem to have a downward drift in frequency that, depending on your density model for the star, corresponds to speeds that would be right for an energetic coronal mass ejection. But we would really like to be able to follow this event down to lower frequencies or over a wider range of frequency and see, is this really that traditional drift in frequency that you expect for space weather events? Again, looking at this solar coronal mass ejection, this has a fractional bandwidth where maximum frequency over minimum frequency is a factor of 10. In contrast to most stellar observations have had a fractional bandwidth where max frequency over min frequency has been 1.5 or less. So the goal of this project was to be able to observe a wide range from max frequency to min frequency of a factor of a few instead of 50%. So how do we detect stellar CMEs? We need a wide fractional bandwidth. We need sensitivity to observe at stellar dis distances, cooled receivers, and large telescopes. And we need lots of observing time. If we're looking for the highly energetic events, the once a month events, then we would like to have a dedicated facility. So I worked on the Starburst program, which was using the two 27 meter antennas at the Owens Valley Radio Observatory and putting a single baseline correlator to combine the sig radio signals from the two telescopes and do spectroscopy from one to six gigahertz simultaneously. And we were going to have simultaneous photometry with a small optical telescope to look for flares. And this project was in commissioning and had we'd been working on it for two years, had a starting to function correlator when it was determined that the structural testing that was done at the beginning of the project had been completely wrong, and these antennas, which are 60 years old, are made of rust, and they're about to fall down, and no one's allowed to go near them anymore. So that project ended, and the project did go south. The hardware, the system has been repurposed as a solar spectrometer at the South Pole. But at the same time, I have a very suspicious nature, and so I wanted backup data, and I proposed VLA observations, very large array, 
and very long baseline array observations of some of the targets, the M-dwarfs, that we were going to look at with the Starburst project. So the three things we wanted, wide fractional bandwidth, sensitivity, and observing time. We can get two of them. We can get some observing time, but we can get two of them with the very large array. Mm -hmm. So I combined data from the very large array and the very long baseline array to try a two-pronged approach to look for stellar coronal mass ejections. With the very large array, I was making dynamic spectra, time versus frequency, to look for analogs to this solar coronal mass ejection. And I had 58 hours of data divided across five stars, covering a wide range of frequencies. With a very long baseline array, I was imaging the corona of the star. And I'll go into the motivation for that in a moment. So the very large array, how was I able to get this wide frequency coverage that I wanted? You're able to divide the VLA into subarrays, observing at different frequencies. So that way I could observe from 230 megahertz up to 4 gigahertz, all simultaneously. And these different frequencies, the motivation for doing that is that different frequencies correspond to different distances from the star. Now, while solar plasma emission from CMEs occurs at hundreds of megahertz and below, we expect it to occur at higher frequencies in these stars due to the large density that has been observed in the coronae of these stars. So one to four gigahertz would give us emission from the corona of the star close to the star, whereas the lower frequencies, 230 to 490 megahertz that we observed, would give us emission from sources at a few stellar radii. Now, why did I combine with this VLBA data? The motivation was to look for large-scale structure in the corona of the star during flares. Now, here's the radio emission from the sun, and the yellow line is the photosphere. This is the quiet sun, but in general, the radio emission from the sun is at gigahertz frequencies is nearly the size of the photosphere, just a little larger. But here's the size of the photosphere of UV SETI, one of the best known M dwarf flare stars in M6. And here's the 8.4 gigahertz radio emission from UV SETI observed in 1996 during a stellar flare. So during a flare, something occurred that produced two lobes of emission separated by four stellar diameters. We really just guessed that the star might be somewhere in the center there. So my motivation was to look for this type of event associated with a burst that's the type of burst that you see from CMEs. So the VLA survey we found consistent with past results that coherent radio bursts on these stars are very abundant. And something that we were able to see is long duration emission, which hadn't been well characterized before on these stars because most observations of flare stars have been done with a single dish where you pretty much have to subtract the emission during the flare from the emission before the flare. So you lose things that vary slowly with time. We used an interferometer where you basically, uh, you don't need to worry about extra background creeping into your signal. So instead, we're able to see long duration events. And we saw that events on coherent bursts on these stars occur on a wide variety of time scales you get bursts that last more than an hour. And this is kind of phenomenal because the time scale for the high energy electrons that you need to drive coherent emission, the time scale for them to dissipate is seconds or less. Which means that if you see a burst of emission for hours, there is something driving electron acceleration consistently throughout those hours. And we saw events on AD Leonis and UV SETI that I'll highlight, as well as a few other events. 
And we also saw short duration events lasting seconds to minutes. The short duration events, it's more likely that the electrons that powered these bursts do originate from the electron acceleration in individual flares or potentially at coronal shock fronts. And how to read these plots? Again, these are dynamic spectra. So time is on the x-axis, frequency on the y-axis. Red shows you where there's emission, and blue shows you where there's no emission. So I'll highlight a few different events, starting with AD Leonis. AD Leonis was that star where we've observed these 10 to the 34 erg flares before. We don't know what happened with the flares during this data, though, because we didn't have simultaneous optical data. Now, what we did see, though, is we observed AD Leo for four hours at a time, two weeks apart. And both times, we saw very intense coherent emission with strong circular polarization from about 1.1 to 1.6 gigahertz. And you see a very sharp drop off in the emission above or below these frequencies. And what could be causing this? Well, there's an analog on the sun that might explain this. They're called type one storms. But what is going on in the analog on the sun is that you have mag new magnetic flux emerging through the photosphere over the course of days to weeks. And as a new magnetic structure emerges through the photosphere, it drives ongoing magnetic reconnection, providing a population of accelerated particles in a closed magnetic structure. Then the bandwidth, the clearly defined bandwidth of this burst would correspond to the range of plasma densities or or cyclotron frequencies that you can see between the bottom of the structure and the top of the structure. However, another possibility is also that this bandwidth may be a beaming effect due to directional beaming of the emission. Now, I had simultaneous VLBA imaging during these data sets. And in the first epoch, the emission from the star was at quite high levels and we saw a couple of flares. Now, with the VLBA, we observed at higher frequencies than the VLA. We were looking for a different type of emission. What we were looking for is gyrosynchrotron emission, which is cyclotron, so electron cycling a magnetic field line, but from mildly relativistic electrons. And we see gyrosynchrotron emission from these non-thermal, mildly relativistic electrons over the course of minutes to hours and ongoing on these stars. But we saw two likely gyrosynchrotron flares on this star. And the first was coincident with the quiescent emission from the star. And then the star goes back to low levels. But then a few minutes later, you see a burst that's offset by almost a full stellar diameter, 0.9 stellar diameters from the first flare. So that was pretty exciting because that's the type of event that we would like to look for when we're looking for evidence of coronal mass ejections is an off-limb flare. However, since the magnetic field of these stars is very strong. It's possible that this flare is still confined within the magnetic field. So we wanted to look for two pieces of evidence at once. We wanted to see an off-limb flare, and we wanted to look at the dynamic spectrum to see if we saw any evidence of a coronal mass ejection shock front. Now, we didn't in the dynamic spectrum, unfortunately, but it shows that combining these two methods can help us look for more convincing evidence of dynamic processes in the coronae of these stars. So on to what is my favorite star, UV SETI. So UV SETI, even its quiet emission, is 100 times brighter than the radio emission from the sun, which is impressive because it's got 100 times less surface area. And then during coherent bursts, it gets 100 times brighter than that. That's an image. 
And here's dynamic spectra of some of the coherent bursts. So time on the x-axis, frequency on the y-axis. And you see emission at a wide range of frequencies that occurs at many different frequencies at roughly the same time. And you see this on many different dates. I'm not going to go into too much detail on these, but I lined them all up. And what you see is for these complex structures in the time frequency plane, there's quite a bit, not identical, but there's quite a bit of morphological similarity between different observations months to years apart. And they also maintain the same sense of circular polarization, right, strong right circular polarization across many years. So the consistent circular polarization is indicating that there's a, the same magnetic field orientation is dominating in the source region in all the different epochs. So what's the potential explanation for this? I think this, the best explanation is that this star also has a periodic radio aurorae where you're seeing bursts of emission once per rotation period. And then the consistency of the structures in the time frequency plane would be a geometric effect due to the beaming of the emission. And this would then be cyclotron maser emission produced at the local cyclotron frequency. And since we see emission from 250 megahertz to 8.5 gigahertz, that means that we're seeing we're seeing emission from a range of magnetic field strengths over a factor of 30. So a range, a wide range of heights in the atmosphere of the star. And I've conducted recent 1.5 gigahertz observations with the Deep Space Network to try to confirm the periodicity of the star's emission. So I also had simultaneous VLBA data for this star. And I just want to show you something that I thought was cool first, which is when I first imaged the star, I was like, uh, what's going on? That's not good. And I realized that I'd forgotten to take out proper motion, parallax, and orbital motion over the course of the four-hour observation. The star is in a wide binary. It's only a few parsecs away, and so and it's moving fairly fast. So that is what you're seeing there. But in addition, Here's, once I took those effects out, here's an image of the quiet emission of the star. And here's the coherent radio burst. So the coherent emission, the likely the aurora, is seen even at high frequencies on the star. And interestingly, it's quite a bit offset from the, co from the quiet emission. And since the coherent emission has to come from a region with a really strong magnetic field, that implies that the burst is actually close to the photosphere of the star, suggesting that maybe the quiet emission is actually originating far, quite far from the star. So I have to follow up on that. <laughs> All right, so the last event I'll highlight is on YZ Canis Minoris, another well-known M-dwarf flare star. And this is a shorter duration event with individual spikes that are shorter than the one second time integrations that we have, as well as longer duration features that drift more slowly. Now these vertical spikes, we didn't detect frequency drift in them because of the limits of our integration time. But if we assume that the vertical extent is caused by frequency drift, then it puts a lower limit on the rate of source motion and would imply source speeds of about 10% of the speed of light. So this may be analogous to those events we see in the sun with beams of electrons, high speed electrons shooting away from the sun. Interestingly, we don't see this event continuing to lower frequencies, which implies that these electrons may be in a confined flaring region stuck within the magnetic field so that the accelerated particles in this event aren't necessarily impacting planets. And here is an illustration of a flaring region where you would get beams of electrons shooting out of it. 
Interesting. And another interesting feature is that this event has right circular polarization shown in blue and left circular polarization, no, right shown in red and left shown in blue, which indicates that you probably have varying magnetic field orientation in the source regions for this burst. So we see a diverse set of processes in the dynamic spectra of coherent bursts on these stars. And I'm going to skip this other than saying that 20, so in L band, 1 to 2 gigahertz, or 1 to 1.5 gigahertz, these stars are producing coherent bursts, luminous coherent bursts, 25% of the time which actually makes them a significant source of transients for transient, for transient radio transient surveys at these frequencies. Now, something I did want to mention is that I said that there, were, there was long duration emission from these stars, lasting hours, and we saw this on four out of the five stars we looked at. Now, I plotted the Stokes V showing the circular polarization of these long duration events. Blue is left circularly polarized, and red is right circularly polarized. Now, we've got a small sample still, but you do see some consistency for different stars. Short events can vary, but long duration events seem to have a consistent polarization on a given star. Now, you can use optical spectral polarimetry over time to map the large-scale magnetic field of these stars. That's called Zeeman Doppler imaging. And I won't go into that, but it does give you a fairly good handle on whether you're seeing the north magnetic pole of the star or the south magnetic pole of the star. And here, the stars that look blue are the ones where the south magnetic pole is up, and the ones that look red are the ones where the north magnetic pole is up. So if I put these two next to each other, there's some evidence that maybe the orientation of the large-scale magnetic field of the star is consistent with the polarization of the long-duration coherent emission from these stars. Now, that suggests that even though we don't have confirmation of period periodicity from these, for any of these sources as, as of yet, and it may not be periodic, this emission, whatever it is, this hours long super luminous radio emission from these stars is possibly an auroral process like that seen on Jupiter and brown dwarfs. And to highlight this again, what this is suggesting is that the long duration emission, which the polarization is likely determined by the magnetic field orientation of the star, would be originating in the large scale field where the polarity is set by the star's large scale magnetic orient dipole orientation. Whereas the short duration bursts, which have varying circular polarization, would be originating from small scale structures, which have essentially random or magnetic orientation, and where you're likely to get flaring. So there were a few features in some of these events that I had glossed over so far, where we saw little blips of emission and weren't able to identify that. Is, is that part of a CME burst? Is that associated with a flare? Is it an auroral process? What's going on? Now, what can help us differentiate? Having the optical data to know if there's an optical flare is something that can help us tell the difference. So there was a well-known flare star in the K2 field over the course of the summer, CN Leo, Wolf 359, also well-known for hosting the Battle of the Borg. And so we got K2 optical monitoring over the course of the whole summer and simultaneous radio data for a handful of different epochs throughout the summer. And an undergraduate student, Aaliyah Wofford, worked on imaging this data this summer and produced a time series 
for the high frequency radio emission from the star, so far demonstrating that there was a large radio flare corresponding to the largest optical flare observed on the star over the course of the summer. So stay tuned for updates on the low frequency emission and any coherent bursts we find. But in summary, dynamic spectroscopy can probe dy dynamic processes in the atmosphere of a star, but it reveals a wide diversity of events. And so we need lots of observations and other wavelengths to help us sort through this information. We didn't see any canonical CME events in our 58-hour survey, but we're still stuck with do we need to go to lower frequencies? Do we need more sensitive telescopes? Or are these stars just not making CMEs or not making CMEs that form shocks and produce radio emission? In addition, I used very long baseline imaging to look for extended structures in the stellar corona corresponding with flares. And I'm following up on this now by using optical and radio together to look for which radio bursts are associated with optical flaring, which is what you would expect for space weather events. Thank you. So that's UV SETI, or that's the 80 LEO event you're talking about. So on 80 LEO, I think that they are probably, in this case, only marginally related processes, <laughs> which is, I would really like to just get a nice canonical solar model flare event where you have the extended emission in the VLBA, which is higher frequencies, it's seeing the non-thermal incoherent emission, and to see a drifting coherent burst as well, but we haven't found that. Instead, we're probably seeing some sort of ongoing reconnection in the low atmosphere of the star, driving the consistent low frequency emission at consistent frequencies, and at the same time, Maybe you have a flare elsewhere on the star that powers the VLBA flares. Or maybe it is that reconnection also has a few times where it gets more intense or something, or higher in the atmosphere it causes a flare. Yes, it would be convenient if they were <laughs> correlated, though. No one knows. For these stars, it's quite possible that it could be self-generated because, yeah, you need a supply of plasma free electrons in the outer magnetosphere of the star. And if these stars are ejecting plasma regularly in flares and possibly coronal mass ejections, then that's not a problem. It is a problem, though, for brown dwarfs, where they have very neutral outer atmospheres, which means that you shouldn't be able to get non-potential magnetic field configurations into the outer atmosphere of the brown dwarf to release energy in flares and eruptions. So where are you getting a supply of electrons to drive these aurorae and to drive occasional flares that you see on brown dwarfs. So that is really a puzzle that hasn't been resolved. 
I of the Zeeman effect gives you sort of an average magnetic flux across the star, and that's typically about three kilogauss, so corresponding to a cyclotron frequency of eight gigahertz near the surface of the star. And the, um, the Stokes V gives you just the magnitude of the low order magnetic multipole moments, so dipole, quadrupole, maybe the one beyond that. And that typically has a strength of about one kilogauss. Um, so. Yes. Yes. So I know it's not, and maybe this is an unfair question, but uh, I know you can't make anything specific about the Have you got a feeling for where the weight came up from? I don't know. It's bad for business for me if I say yes. <laughs> um, I think we understand it all poorly enough that I think it's worth looking at them. I say I trust early M dwarfs more than late M dwarfs. By the time you get to late M dwarfs, the stars the planets are close in enough that they're moving in and out of the closed magnetic field region of the star. And that will result in some very violent interactions. So that re it results in a very rapid time scale for atmospheric loss when you're that close in. So yeah, the TRAPPIST-1 planets are very questionably habitable. But, you know, we could, when we get to the point where we can do transit spectroscopy of exoplanet atmospheres, we may find big surprises. So I don't, I do not have the sense off the top of my head. I've seen estimates based on stellar wind for Trappist one Proxima Sen that I think they came up with like hundreds of Gauss or kilogauss. It was something very large, which Peter can, <laughs> yeah, for terrestrial planets, Peter can weigh in on that. <laughs> Unrealistic. Um, uh, yeah, so, but then, I don't know, people also argue over this because a stronger magnetic field increases the cross-section of the planet for interaction with the stellar wind, causing more stellar wind energy and coronal mass ejection energy to be deposited into the magnetosphere. So maybe a planet with a strong magnetic field is bleeding atmosphere out its poles at a really high rate. We have rotation periods for all of my stars. The one where I'm most confident we're seeing a rotationally modulated aurora is also the fastest rotator. UV SETI has a rotation period of five and a half hours. The others are of order two to three days. So they're still among M dwarfs, they are the, rapid, the most rapid rotators. I'd say, I think Zeeman Doppler imaging 
gives us probably more information at this point than the radio emission, since the radio emission is quite complex to model. But both tell us that you do need a way of sustaining strong large-scale fields on these stars. In order to produce an aurora, you need a strong magnetic field strength at many stellar radii in order to generate energy and currents that drive the aurora. Whether that's a dipole or a quadrupole, you need a strong low order magnetic field. So the old, now out of fashion idea that a fully convective star only makes small scale fields is out. Um, interestingly, UV SETI and its wide binary companion, VL SETI, have been mapped with Zeeman doubler Im spectral polarimetry. And UV SETI has a strong large scale field, much stronger than the, the large scale field components on its companion, VL SETI. Now, UV SETI is the only one that I know so far to have an aurora, since I was able to identify the emission with that star. And it's much more active in flaring. So, <laughs> whatever is going on with and they are both M5.5 to M6, same age, and same rotation period. So whatever is going on that causes dynamos and magnetic field structures of very similar stars to diverge also has an impact on all these different stellar activity properties. Yes, so um, there are many different facet, facets to the sun's radio emission. For the largest flares, the flare is well correlated with the occurrence of a type two radio burst, which is that radio burst that sweeps downwards in frequency, originating at the shock front of a coronal mass ejection. The larger the flare, the better the correlations hold up in general in the sun, which is why it's frustrating that M dwarfs are not behaving. <laughs> um, so it's also well correlated with an increase in the incoherent non-thermal emissions seen at higher frequencies at eight gigahertz, the stuff we were looking at in VLBA. In the sun, large flare is gonna get you some of that. Whereas in these stars, it's correlated or coincident half the time. So these stars have electron acceleration processes a lot of the time that are invisible in flaring. 